So uh, two quick things before I get into it. I learned a long time ago that even if you have a really interested audience and you mainly speak, they're going to only remember about 15, 20% of what you have to say. So I got four stories to tell, but I'm going to keep it short. And that leads me to the second point. I think I got 45 minutes on the agenda. I'm not going to need 30. Okay, so, <laughs> so get you out for lunch uh, a little bit earlier. As much as Kevin is into the Maple Leafs, I'm an uh, unashamed uh, Boston Bruin fan, but I grew up in a Leaf household. My parents had season tickets, and I rode the roller coaster. Well, it's I don't know if it's pretty much of a roller, but anyways, I did the Leaf thing um, all my youth, but I'm mainly a Bruins fan. In the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of research on the, the 30s and 40s hockey, especially the Bruins, and I wrote a book uh, about the Bruins in the 1930s. But what I got out of that book was how much the Bruins and the Leafs really shaped each other's franchises at a very early period. It was not only just because of the Conn Smythe, Art Ross feud, um, the, the team had a lot of battles in the playoffs. And if you look at the 17 years between 1933 and 49, they met in the playoffs eight times. My generation was kind of like Leafs and Habs, right? You know, that's what we kind of got from the 50s and the 60s. But if you look at uh, the history of the NHL, the first 25 years of the NHL, the, the Toronto and Montreal met twice. And Toronto wasn't. Maple Leafs yet when they met both times. They were the arenas in the same paths. Um, you can go to the next uh, slide there, come on, There's some other rivalries that you could point to from the early NHL. Amer uh, New York had two teams, the Americans and the Rangers, and certainly they had a lot of regular season battles. But again, they only met twice. And the same for the, uh, the Habs and the Maroons, twice. So when you compare that to what Boston and Toronto was going through every year, um, it just led me, it, it kind of segued into this, this second project, the second book I was doing. And I thought, I want to find some really good stories. And more than that, I want to find some really good action photos from the period that illustrate them. And I was lucky enough to stumble upon some archives and some private collectors that had some that um, I passed by fairly learned people that had never seen these photos before. So I just want to tell four short stories of this rivalry. And I've got a few little video clips too, which are pretty rare. And, uh, and then that'll be it. So uh, the first story, I wanna go on the next slide there. So the first time that these teams met in the playoffs was in the 1933 semis. And we've all probably heard of this game. It's still the second longest in NHL history. It's the longest between these franchises. Um, but the story uh, that I'm gonna tell isn't about the six overtime periods. It's about how Boston should have won in the third period. So in the third period, Boston had a penalty and puck went into Boston's end, came out, a couple of Leafs were still trapped in there. The puck was being shot back into Boston's end. Alex Smith, he's number 16, came out to the blue line and hit him in the chest. Puck bounced away, he went in on a partial breakaway and scored. All of Maple Leaf Gardens where the game was being played, you know, groaned. But then the referee, Odie Clayhorn, he called it back. He said, plays offside. And Boston couldn't understand, even the Toronto press didn't understand what was going on. The Globe the next day said there was no apparent reason for this offside. It actually led to a clarification in NHL rules. Clayhorn pretty much admitted he'd made a mistake and it was more of an intent thing. He thought it was gonna go in and it didn't. But he called the play afterwards. So the goal was disallowed and in what we would call makeup style today, Clayhorn called three consecutive penalties on Toronto. So Boston had no excuse not to win this game afterwards. Even more so in the first overtime period, he called three more consecutive periods of penalties against Toronto. So Boston had six power plays in a row. Again, I'm a Bruins fan. They had no excuse not to win. Anyways, um, game went on. Uh, at the end of the fifth overtime period, there was all this creativity around trying to end the game. Let's flip the coin. Let's pull the goalies. Our Ross didn't know, but C.F. Adams, is the owner of the Bruins, had sent a telegram saying, stop the game, but he didn't get it. Six overtime period, and Kenny Doherty scored on an Eddie Shore miscue. He played almost the entire game. I don't know how many minutes that is nine periods and he was exhausted, tried to fire it into Toronto's end, it got picked off and that was the game. This is one of the photos from that game. Um, I have several others um, and it shows another little story. Uh, Teeny Thompson, in my opinion, was the first great puck handling goal. First to be credited with assist. 
he scored a goal in that exhibition game, and this is Thompson clearing the puck. He's almost hitting Joe Lamb as, as it goes out. So that's, um, that's the first story. And after that calamity, the Boston Press started to call this for the other playoff series, the Maple Leaf Jinx. And through the 30s, Boston couldn't beat Toronto until it really counted. So let's, let's move on to the next story. Oh, sorry, I got a video. This is a short little video clip I found. And Alex Smith is number 16, so you'll see it just after here. This is Smith coming down and scoring. So that's, that's all we have of, of that. Well, I have about five minutes of that game, but I was able to find a clip of Alex Smith scoring that goal. There, uh, there's some discussion afterwards in that, but it's very abbreviated, but I think that was part of Boston saying, yes. <laughs> so the next story. So second time they met, and I'm not gonna do all eight playoff series, like I said, I'll get you out of here quick. The second time they met was in the 35 semis, and game four, um, Toronto was up for eliminating Boston. The Bruins were up one nothing late in the third period, and uh, Baldy Cotton was in the crease and really giving it to Tiny Thompson. Goalie interference and all that sort of stuff. Puck came in and Thompson stopped it, dropped his stick, and Cotton pushed him away and fired the puck in. This is the instant after that goal was scored. You can see the light is on, on the right, the goal light. And if you look at the crowd, like this gentleman here, you can see them cheering. Joe Primo's celebrating the goal. You notice he's wearing a helmet. So anyways, but the, the biggest thing I, I like about this photo is you can see Teeny Thompson, he's got a stick in the wrong hand. He's picked it up after being shoved by Cotton and Eddie Shore. It's almost like they're looking at you protesting. They're protesting the referee here. Should be no goal. Well, led to a little bit of a discussion and scrum and Cotton and Thompson got into it. And if you go to the next photo, it led to this. There was a huge brawl. Uh, and you'll notice Thompson's wearing a bandage on his face. He got nailed in game two by a puck and every intermission they had to keep replacing the, uh, the bandage and that. So just, the, I, I can't understand how somebody can play NHL hockey with the in goal with no mask. I don't like those, those guys are incredible. Uh, and uh, there's some guy named, oh, no, no, back, there's some guy named Conacher that's kind of taking on uh, two guys there, right? He's taking on uh, Peggy O'Neill and uh, MTV Thompson. And you see Primo in the helmet again. Anyways, what this led to was um, two guys jumped over the boards to join the scrum, one from each team. Babe Cyber and I think it was Bill Toms. Cyber got a penalty for jumping over the boards and Toms did not. So Toronto got a power play and they tied the game up and power plays, power penalties then if you score, of course, you, the penalty continued on and then they won it in overtime. So again, the press in Boston was going, Maple Leaf Jinx, there's always something that's robbing us, you know, that shouldn't have, shouldn't have happened. So uh, I'm jumping ahead here, but uh, 38 or 36, they met at the quarterfinals. And again, there's a whole story around that. Uh, it was the last two game quarterfinals uh, that they ever had total goals. Boston was up three to nothing. They lost eight to three in the second one. There's a big story around that about how King Clancy basically goaded Eddie Shore into getting it into it with a referee and Shore got a misconduct and that opened up the, uh, the goal train. In 38, they, uh, they lost in the semifinals to the Leafs again. The Bruins were magical that year. Please let it not be like that this year. The, the Kraut line, that was their first year of really being together and the Leafs skinned them again. So it was like every year. 39, they finally won it in the finals uh, and beat Toronto. And they beat Toronto in a very, very close semifinals in 41. Uh, went seven games. I think the last four games, the scores were all two to one. But I'm gonna jump into something else. This is a story that I think a lot of us have heard about this, um, a pastor who played goal for the Bruins. Uh, by the 43-44 season, the NHL was denuded of a lot of talent due to the war, especially goalies. By the 43-44 season, Montreal had an embarrassment of riches. They had this rookie goalie named Bill Dern who came in and he did some great things. But they had four or five other really high quality NHL goalies and they, um, they let Boston side and Burke Gardner. They rolled into town and Gardner had the flu. So our Ross went half day and said, do you have a goalie for me? And he said, yeah, our practice goal. So the fellow's name was George Abbott. He was a pastor, that's a little too on the nose for me. <laughs> but uh, he had been a goalie in the 30s and he got hit in the eye 
and kind of ended his career, went into the clergy, and he was posted to Toronto during the war. So um, our Ross called him on the phone, and uh, in an interview in 1956, he recalled what had happened. And he said he was literally shaking when Ross asked him, would you play for us, you know, on the, on the 27th? And he accepted. He said when he came into the dressing room, he ran into Boston's trainer, Wynn Green, who was a legend. And Green said, oh, where the hell do you think you're going? <laughs> and he had to explain who he was. When Ross found out, he called up Day and thought it was a practical joke. But he had no other choice. And uh, George Abbott went in. He did, uh, no, he, go back. He, um, he did fairly well in the first period. It was 1-1. But then the Leafs started to run him. And uh, yeah, knocked him over a couple times, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, during a break in play, Abbott went to King Clancy, who was the referee, and said, why aren't you calling any of these times when the Leafs are running into me? Clancy said, um, I haven't seen anything. And Abbott said, that's just the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, it kind of fell apart in the second period. The Leafs scored three goals in a row, and they all went in off broom legs. And every time that happened, the guy would swear, and they'd go, oh, sorry, Pastor, <laughs> and apologize. They ended up losing 7-4, to four, but uh, despite a hat trick by some guy named Doug Gallagher in that game. But um, up until now, I don't think anybody's ever found a game action photo of George Abbott. And this is one, he's stopping Bob Davidson here. He didn't stop Davidson three other times. Davidson also had a hat trick in that game. So you can go to the close up. And if you look, that is not Burke Gardner. And I actually got it up in archives and there's some other photos from that game. Um, so that's the first photo I think we've all seen of this one game wonder who was a, a pastor and played a game. Uh, he didn't accept any money. Uh, Art Ross finally convinced him to accept $150 for his parish. And he went back to being his practice goalie and served in the clergy. And that was his one game NHL career. So one of the early e bugs, I guess. Last story. So these are all the Boston Bruin sweaters for their first 25 years of their history. All of them are authentic, except the two that have been colorized at the bottom. These were rare jerseys. Do you, do you notice anything that's kind of missing from these sweaters? Like what's ubiquitous with the Boston Brooms? <laughs> the team that's called the blank and gold? There's no black sweater, right? So where, where's the black sweaters for the team that was black and gold? And by the way, Boston didn't bring in black until uh, the football style jerseys in 35, 36. I've put, uh, these are authentic ones from the hall in the upper right corner, and I've looked at the one with the B. And it's a very, very dark brown, but it is a brown. So it's sometimes mistaken for black. And you'll see that on different sites that, oh, they had it in the last year, it was black. It was from an auction site, something like that one. Uh, wanna flip to the next slide? Okay, so uh, there's, it's a couple bullet points. So just press and press. So, so what's missing is a primary black sweater. So who prompted the Bruins to finally adopt a black sweater? And you might be surprised to learn it is Con Smythe. So this is another way that the teams actually influenced each other. So next slide. The reason is because of television. In the United States, um, there was a lot greater and earlier penetration of television than here in Canada. And by the 48-49 season, the Bruins were regular televising games. Too bad they weren't taped and kept and all that. But. So Con Smythe ever the innovator, he wanted to do a television test. It wasn't broadcast, but he wanted to have TV in play. And the game he picked was December the 9th, 1950, and the Bruins were coming to town. And uh, he asked Art Ross, could you wear a dark jersey? We're gonna wear white, black and white at the time with the contrast. So Art obliged. And you know, today a new jersey would come with a huge media campaign and everything like that. There was no hullabaloo whatsoever. There was only one Boston paper that reported on it, the Daily Record said the, uh, the next day, if you'd been in Toronto, you wouldn't recognize the Bruins who were in a primarily black, you know, uniform, et cetera, et cetera. And that was kind of the only mention. You go to the next slide. So what, what the, they were very plain, no shoulder yokes, minimal striping, and they wore that style of jersey for just that season. The next season they adopted shoulder yokes and changed the striping in that. And that was the jersey that they wore, sweater for, for the old, uh, old timers. Sorry, I, I, I'm younger, I keep the yeah, jersey sweater. Um, this is from uh, the 51 playoffs uh, in the semifinals, and this is the 1-1 game, the game that ended 1-1 because of the blue laws. You couldn't play, uh, it was a Saturday night, you couldn't play into Sunday. 
And I just love this photo, not so much because it illustrates the, um, the, uh, the, the sweaters that I was talking about, but there's a whole bunch going on here. Photographer in the background, scrum around uh, Bill Ezenicki, who had been a Leaf and was a terror to the Bruins. Well, now he was trying to turn the tables. He was with the Bruins and now trying to turn it on the Leafs. So uh, you'll notice Weston Adams, the Bruins owner, he's the fellow up holding the hand up, you know, not wanting to get a stick in the face. You can see Lynn Patrick, uh, Boston's coach, and Du Martin Schmidt kind of yelling. So, but anyway, some great illustrations of those sweaters. And I've got a video from that 1-1 one -one game. Jeff, Jeff, is that the right story? I believe so. Yeah, and he's, check, he's checking it out, right? <laughs> Stay it back. Okay, who am I going to nail? So this is uh, 30 seconds of video from that. Uh, oh, sorry, this isn't from the 1-1 game. This is from game five, but it's from the, the same. Um, the same, yeah, the same series, and it illustrates the the Bruins sweaters here. That's a Quackenbush, but it's not Bill. That's Max. One season that. Peter Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. And Schmidt, Dumar. So there's a. I picked out this clip specifically because there were some pretty good players in it. But anyway, that is the only year that Boston wore that sweater. But from then on, except for two years in the 50s and two in the 60s, they have had a primary black sweater ever since. And their third sweater right now is that first one. If you look at it, uh, it's you know no shoulder yokes, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because of Con Smythe. Like, it wasn't a Bruins innovation. So there's a lot of stories that I found like that about how the franchises really affected each other and influenced each other. And uh, I've got 60 more that I put together in a book uh, called the, the First Great Rivals, Shameless Shill, sorry. Uh, and it's basically story on the left, picture on the right. Most of them have never been seen before, all the players identified, et cetera, et cetera. So I have to go back to the, uh, the show down the road. I'm working at the Hall of Fame table, but if anyone's interested, uh, let me know before I go. And thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm.